Hi there, and welcome to Sofa Science with me, Dr. James Brown. In this series, you get to meet some of the amazing scientists we have at Aston University and learn about the incredible research they're doing in the field of health and life sciences, as well as finding out why they got into science in the first place. In today's episode, my guest is someone that I've worked with for far too long, the astronomically talented Dr. Eric Hill. Eric's a senior lecturer in the School of Biosciences, and he's also the program director for the Biosciences MSc programs. But more importantly, he's genuinely a world leading expert in the use of stem cells to model diseases of the brain and does things with cells that sound like science fiction. Eric, hi. Hi, James. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I mean, I literally speak to you every morning anyway, so this is a little bit artificial in that sense, as we like yeah. we like to have a phone call first thing in the morning, but it's great to have you on Sofa Science. I'd like to start by asking you about why you became a scientist or how you became a scientist, because you, like me, had a very non-traditional route into academia. Yeah, so I guess from my background, none of my family have been to college or university. So it wasn't really something I'd ever thought about. And it wasn't really until the end of college that a lot of my friends were going to university. I really started to think about it. And I always knew that I loved science. Um, my grandparents used to take me to science museums. My parents used to buy me science books all the time. It's one of the things that I was really into. So it, it just seemed natural to study biology because it's, it was my favorite subject. And so and that's what I decided to do. I can definitely relate to that. I think the only book I can remember reading as a child was the Macmillan Illustrated Encyclopedia of Family Health. And I used to just sit there reading that all the time, learning what keloid scars are. And I had a very non-traditional route into academia as well. So you're a research scientist doing some really cutting edge research. What would you say is the best part of being a research scientist? So I think it's it's almost like being able to do your hobby as a job. So I love science. I probably, if I won the lottery, set up a lab in my garage and do experiments. Um, so it, it's been that interested in something that you'd spend a huge amount of your time thinking about it, even outside of work hours. Uh, and to be able to get paid to do that and to really find out how things work is, is for me, it's the best thing ever. I think it's very lucky when you've got a job that allows you to do that. So many people end up in careers where they do a nine to five and, and they do the same in same out every day. And, and research science is a bit different to that, really, isn't it? No, definitely. I think particularly from my background, my, my parents, working class background, they didn't understand me going to university and why I wanted to do that. Um, and, and seeing them and struggling with jobs that they didn't really enjoy to have a job where I enjoy it and I get paid to do it. Um, it's completely different from what I was used to seeing from my own family background. I think that's, it's great to see that. One of the things that Aston obviously does is have this wonderful widening participation remit where we tend to take lots of students from non-traditional backgrounds and to see, I mean, you are an Aston um, icon, really. You've, you've been at Aston as an undergraduate, as a postgraduate, as a researcher, and, and now as an academic. So it's great to see how it's developed to you as a, as a scientist. Now, I know and you know that we both have ADHD for anybody listening ADHD stands for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and it's a neurodevelopmental disorder so how do you manage your ADHD alongside what is a really successful and cutting edge research career I think it's, it's it's been difficult at times. I won't say that it hasn't. Um, I think it's been great to have lots of supportive colleagues that understand the way that I work around me. Um, so I think it's having that interest in my job that I guess that dopamine fix has been really useful to, uh, that I've been able to focus on the things that I enjoy that I'm interested with. Uh, that you probably noticed from a lot of the things that I do in the lab, it's kind of latest cutting edge technology, shiny, exciting things. And I think that's really kept my attention. So that's been really helpful. I think what's difficult then is, 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 is the day-to-day -day admin tasks, writing things, doing, uh, keeping up with deadlines, uh, and often using anxiety and stress to make sure I do that. And it wasn't until I was diagnosed four years after, after a conversation with you, James, uh, where I really started to look into it and think, wow, the number of issues that I have is probably to do with this. Um, and since then, I've been much better able to manage my time since my diagnosis, um, having different tips and tricks that I use to stay on track. And of course, my medication helps as well. For anyone that doesn't know Eric, he's he's the king of cell culture. I, I've never met a scientist 
that has a more robust and appropriate response to cell culture. When I was more of a lab scientist, I'd just chuck stuff on cells, see what happened. But I've always been incredibly impressed, despite your ADHD, that you've had such a kind of regimented and robust approach to looking after cells in the lab. Yeah, it, it just has to happen. We, we keep cells from six months to two years. We've kept them in culture with no antibiotics, which is, is quite a feat to, to maintain that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably from not wanting to repeat stuff and do it again, if you're meticulous, then all your experiments should work. You shouldn't have to keep repeating them for that period of time. It saves a lot of money as well. Um, so I think it's, you just have it to keep and maintain that standard. I, I think I've generally in my life, I'm quite tidy um, because it helps with my distractibility, I guess, that uh, if there's not lots of things in the way, I don't get it so easily distracted. So I think it's just nice to have a, nice, a clean workspace, particularly when you're doing something so long term with cells. I, I just got to pick up on that quickly because I, you know, do a bit of cell culture, obviously T two years, you can keep cells alive in the lab without antibiotics for two years. Yeah, yeah, it, it impressed me at the time when we did it. Uh, I think the postdoc in the lab, his son was two years old at the time. So the cells were as old as his first child. Um, and I guess that reflects the, the, the human developmental timeline that we're trying to mirror in the lab, that human cells do take as long as humans do to develop, even when they're grown in addition to the lab. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And it brings us nicely on to really the subject for today's for today's chat, and that's about stem cells, and you're a, a stem cell biologist. So we'll move a little bit more into that area of your research, if that's okay. I think it's probably appropriate to say you're really into human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So can you tell us a bit about what these are and why they might be important in learning about diseases? Yeah. So the, the idea comes from using cells like embryonic stem cells that have the potential to turn into every single cell in your body. So if you think about the early forms of the embryo, when a human embryo is about five days old, that little bundle of cells can turn into absolutely everything, your bone, your hair, your muscle, all of the different cell types that are going to use to grow that human. Um, and so they have this pluripotential, we call them, uh, that they can turn into all of these different cell types. The problem is when you use embryonic stem cells in the lab is that they will come from embryos from IVF. Um, and so a lot of people are concerned with the ethical issues of using those embryos, even if it is from an IVF treatment and they're surplus. Um, and so scientists worked out a way of actually generating those pluripotent stem cells in the laboratory. So what we're now able to do is you can take a cell from your body. So a skin cell is often used or a blood cell can be used and you can reprogram that cell almost like wiping clean a computer. And you use uh, four factors that are known as the Yamanaka factors and you can reprogram that cell back to that embryonic like state so that then that cell that was a skin cell um, might have been on your hand or anywhere like that uh, can be turned into that stem cell. And then for me, my lab, lab, we're interested in brains. So we turn that cell all the way back into a brain cell again. So reversing their developments and then going forward again back in a developmental time span. I mean, that that, that to me is, again, it's, we're now going to start to get into the discussion, which to a lot of people will sound like science fiction. But that's fascinating. So you could take one of my skin cells and turn it into a heart muscle cell or a, a I've got plenty of fat cells, so I won't say fat cells, but you can turn it into technically any, any cell in my, in, that comes from my body. Yeah, and I like to think of it as, as cooking. So as long as we know the right recipe, we can turn that stem cell into any cell type in the body. And we just use different mixtures for different recipes, and it can take a period of weeks or months uh, to make that particular cell type. And so scientists have spent a huge amount of time working out the right recipe for the right cell type uh, so that we can make these cells that function like they should in the body. I mean, that's, that's absolutely incredible. So focusing in a bit more on, on your research and how you apply using these uh, pluripotent stem cells into research, I know that lots of your work um, has been focused on what's known as degenerative diseases of the brain, things like Alzheimer's disease. So how can these cells help us understand and possibly maybe even one day, I don't like the word cure, but certainly better understand and treat these degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's? So I think for me, the main huge challenge in dementia research, Alzheimer's research, is that there is no cure. The treatments that we have don't stop the disease, they don't reverse the disease, they just deal with the current symptoms that the patient has. And probably part of the reason is we don't really understand the disease process and when it begins uh, and how do we get to that final time point. So 
Often with patients, you don't get to work with human brain tissue because patients, while they're alive, need all of their brain. So you can't see in, in real time what the cells are doing. Often when a patient has, has passed away and they've donated their brain, we can look at that brain and look at what's happened to that brain to find out at that point, what did their brains look like? But it's really difficult if Alzheimer's starts 20, 30 years before that period, what actually happened uh, in, when they were maybe in their 30s or 40s. Um, and so often the, the, the field has had to rely on animal models and lots of those models don't naturally get Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so we've developed these drugs that in lots of clinical trials just haven't translated uh, to, to cures. So what's fascinating about this technology is that if I have a patient with Alzheimer's disease uh, and I could look at a control patient who doesn't have the disease that's the same age and sex, I can generate stem cells from both of those patients and then I can turn them, differentiate them into the brain cells that I'm particularly interested in and then see how that they differ, what's different about them in terms of the proteins that they make, the genes that they express. And ultimately for my lab, it's the function of those cells. Um, so we can then start to really compare uh, in, in that time window what happens to those cells probably really early on in maybe even developmental terms as well. I mean, that's, in, that's incredible, frankly, he says, as somebody that always jobbed his way through cell culture. So you're, I know you're currently working on a, a massive project. You normally do work, work on massive projects, but this one in particular genuinely sounds like something out of a science fiction film to me and it's a project i think is called new chip can you tell us about this project and what it what it aims to achieve yeah so i guess one of the things that we found out more recently is how well that these cells can function in a dish uh, and so when we differentiate them and we age them over a number of months we can see that they're really starting to function like human brain cells so naturally in the area that we're working on in terms of dementories are these cells capable of any kind of learning and memory functions, even at the very basic levels? Um, and how would we be able to model that? And what would that tell us about the disease process? Uh, but also how neurons work and how maybe memories are stored as well. Um, combined with our interest in computing technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we can see that computers struggle with certain tasks that humans are very capable of doing very quickly, even at a young age. So, for instance, if I was to want to train a computer to recognize faces, for instance, from photographs, that would take thousands and thousands of hours of training of different images of faces. And if that face was to move in a video, the computer might really struggle with that. If you were to turn that face upside down, it would struggle to recognize that face in that setting. And humans, very small children, can do that without really thinking about it too much. Um, so clearly our brains are, are very capable uh, of learning very quickly. And also when that image changes to adapt to that. And if you're training a computer for that period of time to learn to recognize a face, that uses a huge amount of energy. Um, and so a lot of people are interested in how much energy computers are using at the moment, particularly with global warming. And, and our brains do that on very little energy, like a cup of sugar water uh, might be enough to sustain some really uh, advanced uh, computing power that our brains are capable of. So we're quite interested as well that we can model different access aspects of how the brain works, um, how memory might work, um, but also could we use that knowledge to improve the way that our computers work and the energy that they use? So by working together with engineers and biologists, neurophysiologists, if we can design circuits of our neurons um, by engineering surfaces and positioning them in particular ways, can we get them to learn inputs and measure their outputs? Uh, and can we really use that to understand our brains? And that's great for in diseases like Alzheimer's, because if we take those cells from a patient with Alzheimer's disease, we can look at what the differences between the patient cells are to our healthy controls. I mean, again, it just blows me away to think that you can almost create a computer that's a brain. I know that's massively simplifying what you just said, but effectively it's, it's that, isn't it? It's not just understanding disease, but it's potentially taking computing to the next step, I guess, isn't it? Part of it is that computers are designed on the way they, they uh, engineers think, perhaps the way uh, neurons are connected and the way that they communicate with each other. And with this technology, we're actually able to grow those neurons to see how they actually work uh, properly and then maybe design better computer systems. Um, so it, it's, it's fascinating that we can start, we've got to the point now that we can grow these cells, that we can grow these networks. Um, I'm always careful about not calling them brains, that they're mm -hmm. uh, very precise, like uh, small networks that are no more complicated than the, uh, you know, the chip in your washing machine. Um, um, but the fact that they might in themselves have some kind of power to compute information. That's still arguably more of a brain than I've got, Eric. So very, very closely related. You mentioned earlier about the ethical implications of using 
um, stem cells that come from embryos. Now, I know you're very passionate about <clears throat> the ethics of biological research. You actually teach bioethics here at Aston University in the School of Biosciences. So what are the ethical issues around the cells you use compared to other ways of studying the brain? So I think the first one, as I mentioned earlier, was that by not using embryonic stem cells, we, we remove that issue with using cells that have come from an embryo, that we can create these cells from patient skin cells, of course, make sure that we have full patient consent to be able to do that and to reprogram them into the cell types we're interested in. I think that that has allowed a huge leap in terms of this technology that people are now able to use these induced prepotent stem cells rather than embryonic stem cells. And then it's the application of the cells. And, and it's, it's, it's great to be able to talk to members of the public to see what they're really interested in, what would they like us to do with this technology. And I think a lot of people are very comfortable with using this technology to, mm. to look at diseases, to understand how the brain works uh, and how we can use these model systems to be able to do that. I mean, that, that to me is incredible. You mentioned earlier about the animals that get used in research. And I know that that's a very emotive subject for people. And clearly... As you said, it, it's really difficult to get a hold of someone's brain, particularly when it's as small as mine, and I don't want to give any of it up. So it's incredible that you could take my skin cells and effectively then tell me how, my, particularly my ADHD brain, tell me how the different neurons and other cells in the brain fire. I'm looking forward to a, a Hollywood film in the future, which is based on <laughs> the work that you're doing where uh, a, a mini brain is, is grown on a chip. So with everything that we've covered kind of what's next for you and, and where do you take the research next given a unlimited budget and all the time in the world what would you like to do with these cells so i guess we're at the, the very start of the new chip project and so we're just learning how to to get these cells to grow together to position them in different ways um and then i think it's what they're capable of um and what information can we put into them and what will come back out so i think that's really interesting i think some of the the big leaps forward with this technology is that now people are able to grow different brain cells from different brain regions and, and, and piece them together almost like Lego. Uh, and we call those assembloids. So we can grow cells in three dimensions. Uh, they're called organoids because they're an organ-like structure. And they have some, um, I guess, structures that you'd expect to see in certain regions of the brain. But you can make brain organoids from different regions of the brain and then you can fuse them together to form these assembloids that start to connect together. Um, so already we start to see fascinating research in this field from those uh, assembloids. So we can really start to understand how brain regions connect uh, and how they become dysfunctional in disease, but also how just normally they connect to each other and how they work. I mean, that's, you've already got the names of some of the bad guys in this film now, assembloids and, and organoids, which will be <laughs> Eric Hill's the hero and these are the, the bad guys you're fighting against. But that just it just sounds... It sounds incredible. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. But before you go, we always finish Sofa Science with um, a bit of an unseen question. So to put you on the spot, you've got a choice. Fingers for toes or toes for fingers. What do you choose and why? I think toes for fingers would make life really difficult. Um, I do have unusually long toes, so it might not be as bad as some people. Um, but I think I'd rather have fingers for toes um, and be able to feel my way around and maybe grip onto trees better. I don't know. <laughs> I think that is probably the, the perfect answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for joining us on Sofa Science. So that's it for this episode of Sofa Science, where we were joined by Dr. Herrick Hill, who talked about his literally mind-blowing research on brain cells and how they can be used possibly as the computers of tomorrow. Eric, thank you so much for your time and I will see you for coffee soon. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye all.